All right, hi everyone. Um, we're on chapter 16. We're getting pretty close to the end. Not too much longer to go. So this chapter is called The Forgotten Chapel. Remember, The Forgotten Chapel is where um, Buhamut is held. He's one of the demons. Um, and it is also where Grandpa and Lena are being held right now. And Grandma, Seth, and Kendra are gonna go try and save him. Or them. So, we're gonna read and then I have some questions for you at the end. So, we'll go ahead and get started. Chapter 16, The Forgotten Chapel. 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 As the sun hesitated above the horizon, Kendra stared out the side of the wagon, watching the trees streak past. She remembered staring at the trees out the window of the SUV on the way to the preserve with her parents. This ride was much noisier, bumpier, and windier, and the destination was much more intimidating. Hugo pulled the oversized rickshaw. Kendra doubted that a team of horses could have matched the tireless speed of his loping strides. They reached an open area, and Kendra saw the tall hedge that surrounded the pond with the gazebo boardwalk. Strange. Sorry. Strange to think that Lena had once lived there as a naiad. Before they boarded the wagon, Grandma had commanded Hugo to obey any instructions from Kendra and Seth. She had told Seth and Kendra that if things went wrong, they should make a hasty retreat with Hugo. She also cautioned them to be careful with uh, what they told Hugo to do. Since he had no will of his own, the punishments for his actions would fall upon the heads of those issuing the orders. Grandma had changed out of her bathrobe. She was now dressed in faded jeans, work boots, and a green top, clothing scavenged from the attic. Kendra had, or sorry, Seth had taken great satisfaction in her choice of green shirt. Seth clutched a leather pouch. Grandma had explained that it was full of special dust that would keep undesirable creatures away from them. She had told Seth he could use it in the same way that he had used the salt in the bedroom. She also warned him to use it only as a last resort. Any magic they would they used would only lead to less tolerable retribution if they failed. She had a pouch of the dust as well. Kendra was empty-handed. Since she had not yet used magic, Grandma said that it would be a mistake for her to start now. Apparently, the protections of the treaty were quite strong for those who totally abstained from magic and mischief. The wagon jolted over a particularly rough spot. Seth caught hold of the side to avoid falling. He looked over his shoulder and smiled. We're a hauling. Kendra wished that she could be so obliviously calm about the whole thing. She was getting sick, a sick feeling in her stomach. It reminded her of the first time that she had tried to sing a solo in the school play, fourth grade. She had always done fine in the practices, but when she had peeked out past the curtain at the audience, a queasy feeling had be, uh, began brooding in her belly until she became certain that she would throw up. At her cue, she walked out onto the bright stage, peering into the dim crowd, unable to find her parents in the throng of people. Her intro was playing, the moment arrived, and as she started singing, the fear dissipated and the nausea vanished. Would it be the save today? Would the anticipation be worse than the event itself? At least once they got there, reality would replace uncertainty and they would be able to do something, to act. All she could do at the present was worry. How far away was this crazy church? Grandma said it wouldn't take Hugo much more than 15 minutes and since there was a decent road all the way. Although she kept an eye out for unicorns, Kendra saw no fanciful creatures. Everything was hiding. The sun dipped below the horizon, Grandma was pointing. Up ahead, in the middle of the clearing, sat an old-fashioned church house. It was a boxy structure with a row of large windows fanged with broken glass and a single cupola that probably contained a bell. The roof sagged, the wooden walls were gray and splintered. There was no guessing what the original color might have been. A short flight of warped steps led up to the empty doorway, where double doors had been once had once granted entrance. Um, it looked like a perfect layer for bats and zombies. So this is the church. You got a nice scary doorway, a place where a bell could probably be. So this was once a church that people actually used and then they imprisoned Muhammad in the basement. So there was no, people stopped going there. Why would you want to go to a church that uh, had a demon in the bottom? So that's what the church looks like. Hugo slackened his pace and they came to a stop in front of the shadowy doorway. The church was completely still and there was no sign anybody had been there for a hundred years. I'd rather have the sun, but at least we still have some light, Grandma said, using a tool to set the silver-headed arrow in the string of her undersized crossbow and pull it into position. Let's get this over with as soon as we can. Evil likes darkness. Why is that? Seth asked. Grandma thought about the question a moment before answering. Because evil likes to hide. Kendra did not appreciate the tingles she got when Grandma said that. Why don't we talk about happy things? She suggested as they climbed down the from the wagon. Because we're hunting witches and monsters, Seth said. 
Kendra's right, Grandma said. It does us no good to dwell on dark thoughts, but we do want to be on the road and away from here before the twilight is gone. I still say we should have brought some shotguns, Seth said. Hugo, Grandma said, lead the way quietly into the basement, protect us from harm, but do not kill. Kendra felt comforted just by looking at the hulking Goliath of earth and stone. With Hugo as their companion, oh, sorry, with Hugo as their champion, she could not picture anything giving them much trouble. The steps groaned beneath Hugo as he climbed them. Stepping gingerly, he ducked through the large doorway. The others followed, staying close to their massive bodyguard. Grandma draped a red scarf over the crossbow, apparently to conceal it. Please let Muriel not be here, Kendra played, si prayed silently. Please let us find Grandpa and Lena and nothing else. The inside of the church was even gloomier than the exterior. The decaying pews had been smashed and overturned, the pulpit at the front had been thrown down, and the walls were graffitied with maroon scrawlings. Spider webs festooned the rafters like gossamer banners. Amber light from the sunset found entry through the window and some irregular holes in the roof, but not enough to dispel the murkiness. There was no token indicating that this had once been a house of worship. It was just a big, dilapidated, dilapidated vacant room. The floorboards creaked as Hugo tiptoed toward the door on the far side of the chapel. Kendra found herself worrying that the floor would give way and Hugo would take an abrupt shortcut to the basement. He had to weigh a thousand pounds. Hugo eased the corroded door open. Since the doorway was of normal size, he had to crouch and twist in order to squeeze through. Everything will be fine, Grandma said, placing a uh, bracing hand on Kendra's shoulder. Stay behind me. The stairs wound down and ended at a doorway without a door. Um, light poured through the, into the stairwell. Peering around Hugo as he contorted to pass through the doorway, Kendra glimpsed that they were not alone. As she followed Grandma Sorensen into the spacious basement, the implications of the scene began to register. The room was cheerfully illuminated by no fewer than two dozen bright lanterns. It had a high ceiling and sparse furnishing. Grandpa Sorensen and Lena were each shackled, spread eagled to the wall. A peculiar figure stood in front of Grandpa and Lena, Fashioned entirely of smooth, dark wood, it looked like a primitive puppet, not much shorter than Grandpa. Instead of proper joints, the wooden parts were connected by golden hooks at the wrists, elbows, shoulders, neck, ankles, knees, hips, waist, and knuckles. The head made Kendra think of a wooden hockey mask, though it was not quite right because it was cruder and simpler. The unusual mannequin was dancing a little jig, his arms swaying, feet tapping and shuffling, gazing toward the far end of the basement. Is that her limberjack? Seth asked quietly. Of course. It was Muriel's creepy dancing puppet, only much bigger and no longer guided by a rod in his back. So he used to be like a puppet that they would play, like, play with, and now he's just alive. He can move. At the far side of the basement was a large alcove. It looked like someone had torn down some planks to access the niche. A net of knotted ropes crisscrossed the alcove, preventing a view inside the dismal recess. A dark form loomed beyond the ropes. A tall, beautiful woman with lustrous cascade of honey blonde hair stood beside the recess, blowing on one of the many knots. She wore a spectacular azure gown that emphasized her seductive figure. The striking woman was surrounded by what looked like human-sized versions of the imps that Kendra had seen in Muriel's shack. They were all facing the alcove, staring at the ground. They ranged from five to six feet tall. Some were fat, some were thin, a few were muscular. Some had crooked backs or humps or horns or antlers or bulging cysts or tails. A couple were missing a limb or an ear. All had scars. All had weathered, leathery skin and nubs instead of wings. At the feet of the human-sized imps were a multitude of tiny, fairy-sized versions. The air shimmered, and a pair of black wings made of smoke and shadow unfurled from the alcove. Kendra experienced the sense of vertigo that had overwhelmed her when they were changing Grandma back from being a hen. It seemed like the alcove was growing with more distant, like she was looking at it through the wrong end of a telescope. A burst of darkness momentarily eclipsed the steady luminance of the lanterns, and suddenly, in the midst of where all the imps were focusing their attention, a new, human-sized imp sprouted up. Kendra covered her mouth with both hands. The beautiful woman had to be Muriel. Buhamut was imprisoned by a web of knotted ropes, similar to the rope that had trapped her, and she was using wishes to increase the size of her imps, gradually freeing the demon in the process. Hugo, Grandma said softly, incapacitate the imps and capture Muriel on the double. Hugo charged forward. An imp turned and let out a disgruntled yowl, and the others spun to face the intruders, revealing cruel, devilish faces. 
The gorgeous blonde worm woman turned, eyes widening in surprise. Seize them, she shouted. They were, there were more than 20 of the big imps and 10 times that many small ones. Led by the biggest and most muscular of the lot, they rushed at Hugo, a motley mob of wiry fiends. Hugo met them in the center of the room. With fluid precision, he snatched the leader by the waist with one hand, seizing both feet in the other, and twisted briskly in opposite directions. Hugo tossed the howling leader aside as the others descended on him. Fists flailing like battering rams, Hugo sent imps uh, sailing in wild cartwheels. They swarmed, making agile leaps to land on his shoulders and scratch at his head. But Hugo just kept twirling and twisting and heaving, a violent ballet that sent as many imps as pounced on him careening across the basement. Some of the imps nimbly dodged around him to sprint toward Grandma, Kendra, and Seth. Hugo whirled and charged after them, grabbing a pair of them by the knees and then wielding them like clubs to swat away the others. The resilience of the imps was impressive. Hugo would fling one onto the wall, and the tenacious creature would stumble to its feet and wade back from for more. Even the burly leader was still in the fray, staggering awkwardly on mangled legs. Looking beyond the tumult, Kendra noticed Muriel blowing on a knot. Grandma, she's up to something. Hugo, Grandma cried. Leave the imps to us and go capture Muriel. Hugo hurled the imp he was holding. The whining creature skimmed the ceiling um, the entire distance to the wall, where it impacted with a revolting crunch. Then the golem dashed at Muriel. Mendigo, protect me, Muriel squealed. The wooden man, who was still danced near Grandpa and Lena, sprinted to intercept Hugo. Free from the indom indomitable onslaught of the golem, the injured imps converged on Grandma, who placed herself in front of Kendra and Seth. Holding a pouch in one hand, Grandma swung it so that it scattered a twinkling cloud of dust. As the imps reached the cloud, electricity crackled, hurling them back. A few lunged into the cloud, trying to force their way through it, but the electricity flared brighter and sent them tumbling. Grandma spread more dust into the air. Great dark wings were spreading out from the alcove, the air undulated. Kendra felt like she was viewing the basement from far away, through, the narrow, through a narrow tunnel. Hugo had almost reached Muriel. The overgrown limberjack dived at the golem's feet, using both arms and legs to entangle Hugo's ankles. The golem toppled forward. Hugo kicked free of Mendigo, sending the wooden puppet skidding across the floor, then rose to his knees and reached for Muriel. His outstretched hands were inches from taking hold of her when a thunderclap shook the basement, accompanied by a brief moment of blackness. The massive golem crumpled to the floor into a pile of rubble. Muriel brayed in triumph, eyes crazed, delirious at having so narrowly avoided Hugo's clutches. Off to one side of the room, Mendigo sat up. The puppet had lost an arm at the shoulder. He just picked up the limb and reattached it. Muriel's eyes sharpened as she sensed certain victory. Bring them all to me, she trumpeted. A red scarf fluttered to the floor. Grandma Sorensen raised the crossbow in one hand while scattering the last of the contents of her pouch with the other. She discarded the pouch and stepped forward into the glittering dust cloud, gripping the crossbow in both hands. The arrow took flight. Mendigo sprang, desperately trying to block the dart, but Hugo had knocked the puppet too far away. Muriel shrieked and toppled back against the net of knotted ropes, a manicured hand covering the front of her shoulder. She rebounded forward, falling to her knees, panting, still clutching her shoulder black feathers protruding between slender fingers. You will pay for that sting, she screamed. Run, Grandma Sorensen shouted to the children. Too late. Eyes closed, lips moving soundlessly, Muriel stretched forth a bloody hand and a gust of wind striped away, stripped away the sparkling dust. The injured imps rushed in, seizing Grandma Sorensen roughly. Seth sprang forward, throwing a handful of dust over Grandma and the imps. Lightning cracked, crackled and the imps stumbled away. Mendigo, bring me the boy, Muriel called. The wooden servant, servant charged toward Seth, racing on all fours. The imps had fanned out, several cl clustering near the door to prevent escape. Seth flung dust as Mendigo leaked. The electric cloud repelled the puppet. At the same time, an imp darted in from behind, knocking the pouch from Seth's grasp with a chopping motion. The tall imp twisted around, Seth around, grabbed his upper arms, and hoisted him into the air so that they were staring eye to eye. The imp hissed, mouth open, black tongue dangling grotesquely. Hey, Seth said, recognition drawing, you're the fairy I caught. The imp draped Seth over his shoulder and ran to Muriel. Another imp seized Grandma to bring her to the witch. Kendra stood frozen with terror. Imps surrounded her. Escape was impossible. Hugo had been reduced to a pile of debris. Grandma had missed with the arrow, wounding but not killing Muriel. Seth had done his best, but he and Grandma had been recaptured. There was no more defense, no more tricks. Nothing between Kendra and whatever horrors Muriel and the imps wished to inflict. Except, 
that the imps were not taking hold of her. They stood all around her, yet they seemed unable to reach out with their hands and grab her. They would lift their arms part of the way and then stop as if their limbs refused to obey. Mendigo, bring me the girl, Mirio commanded. Mendigo shouldered through the imps, his hands stretched toward her and then stopped, wooden fingers twitching, hooks clinking softly. They can't touch you, Kendra, Grandpa called from where he hung shackled to the wall. You have caused no mischief, worked no magic, and inflicted no harm. Run, Kendra, they can't stop you. Kendra pushed between a pair of imps, heading for the door, then she stopped short. Can't I help you? Muriel is not bound by the laws restraining her min uh, minions, Grandpa shouted. Run all the way home, straight down the road you came. Do no harm along the way. Don't stray from the path, then get off the property. Ram the gate with my truck. Fablehaven will fall, but one of us has to survive. Muriel, clutching her wounded shoulder, was already in pursuit. Kendra raced up the stairs and dashed ac across the chapel to the front door. Child, wait, called the witch. Kendra paused at the threshold of the church and looked back. Muriel leaned in the doorway that led to the basement. She looked pale, blood drenched the arm of her gown. What do you want, Kendra said, trying to sound brave. Why rush off in such a hurry? Stay, we can talk about this. You don't look so good. Oh, this trifle, losing a sing loosening a single knot will mend it. Then why haven't you done it? I wanted to talk to you before you hurried away, the witch soothed. What is there to talk about? Let my family go, demanded Kendra. I may, in time. Child, you do not want to run off into the woods at this late hour. Who could say what horrors await you out there? They can't beat what's going on in here. Why are you releasing that demon? You could never understand, said Muriel. Do you think it will be your friend? You're going to end up chained to the wall along with the others. Make no speeches about matters far beyond your comprehension, Muriel snapped. I may have com uh, I may yeah. I have made covenants that will place me in position of unfathomable power. After biding my time for long years, I feel my hour of triumph at hand. The evening star is rising. Evening star? Kendra repeated. Muriel grinned. My ambitions extend far beyond hijacking a single preserve. I am part of a movement with much broader objectives. The Society of the Evening Star, said Kendra. You could never imagine the designs already in motion. I've been locked away for years, yes, but not without the means of communicating with the outside world. The imps. And other collaborators. Buhamut has been orchestrating this day since his capture. Time has been our ally. Watching and waiting, we have quietly leveraged countless opportunities to gradually secure our release. No prison stands forever. At times, our efforts have borne little fruit. On gladder occasions, we have toppled many dominoes with a single nudge. When Ephira succeeded in coaxing you to open the window on Midsummer's Eve, we were hopeful that the events would unfold much as they have. Ephira? You looked into her eyes. Kendra cringed. She did not appreciate a reminder of the translucent woman in gauzy black garments. Muriel nodded. She and others are about to inherit the sanctuary, a vital step toward reaching our ultimate ends. After decades of persistence, nothing can forestall me. Then why not just let my family go? Kendra pleaded. They would try to interfere. Not that they could at this point. They had their chance and failed, but I will take no risks. Come, face the end with your loved ones instead of alone in the night. Kendra shook her head. Muriel extended an uninjured arm, the fingers, red with her own blood, contorted into an unnatural shape. She spoke in a garbled language that made Kendra think of me angry men whispering. Kendra ran out of the church, down the steps, and over to the wagon. She paused to look back. Muriel did not appear in the doorway. Whatever spell the witch had tried to cast apparently had no effect. Kendra raced down the road. The sunset was still fairly bright. Um, they, had been seen, they had been inside the church for only a few minutes. Tears began to blind her, but she kept running, unsure whether she was being pursued. Her whole family was lost. Everything had happened so fast. One moment, Grandma was confidently offering assurance. The next, Hugo was destroyed and Seth and Grandma were captured. Kendra could have been captured as well, except she had so been so overcautious since arriving at Fablehaven that she was still apparently shielded by the full power of the treaty. The imps had not been able to lay a finger on her, and Muriel had been too injured to give proper chase. Kendra looked back along the empty road. The witch would have cured the injury by now, but would probably not come after her until freeing Buhamut, since Kendra had such a big head start. Then again, Muriel could possibly use magic to catch up with her. But Kendra suspected that the urgency of unleashing the demon would prevent Muriel from giving chase now. Should she turn around and head back, try to rescue her family? But how? Throw rocks? Kendra could envision nothing but certain capture if she were to return. But she had to do something. When the demon was released, it would destroy the treaty and Seth would die along with Grandpa, Grandma, and Lena. 
The only possibility she could think of was returning to the house and trying to find a weapon in the attic. Could she remember the combination to the vault door? She had watched Grandma open it an hour ago, heard her speak the numbers aloud. She could not recall them, but she felt uh, that she might once she saw it. Kendra knew that she was without hope. The house was miles away. How many? Eight? Ten? Twelve? She would be lucky to make it there, let alone before, let alone back, before Buhamit was free. There were many knots, and it looked like Muriel could undo only one at a time. Each knot seemed to take at least a few minutes, but still, at that rate, it would be a matter of hours, not days before the demon was free. At least finding a weapon at the house was a goal. No matter how desperate the odds, it gave her a direction to head and a reason for going there. Who knew what the weapon would be, or how she could use it, or whatever she could even get in, or whether she could even get into the attic. But at least it was a plan. At least she could tell herself there was a brave reason for running away. Alright, so chapter 17 will be next week. We have 17, 18, and 19 left, so three chapters. We'll finish it um, before school ends on Thursday next week. So, um, yeah, there's that. Chapter 16, we're going to look at a couple of questions here. So chapter 16 questions. Number one, what did Grandma and Seth have inside their leather pouches? Number two, why did Grandma say that evil likes darkness? Number three, what was guarding Lena and Grandpa when they were chained to the wall in the basement? Number four, what was Muriel doing when Grandma, Seth, and Kendra arrived at the church? Number five, what did Grandma, actually that's to be Grandpa, what did Grandpa tell Kendra to do when she realized that they weren't going to, when he realized that they weren't going to win? Number six, how did Muriel communicate with the Society of the Evening Star while she was imprisoned? So who was bringing her information? Number seven, why did Seth take great satisfaction in Grandma's choice of a green shirt? Why did he like her green shirt? Number eight. Why weren't the imps and any other magical creatures able to touch Kendra? And finally, number nine. In your opinion, would you rather be able to wield a magical power like Seth and Grandma had, or would you rather have the total protection like Kendra did? And then tell me why. So that's your chapter 16 questions. Um, I'll be back with chapter 17 soon. Have a good day.